In this video, we're going to train a simple neural network to mimic the sign function from data using automatic differentiation in the Jax framework in Python. For this, we will draw some data that somehow looks like a sign function. Then we will initialize our weights. We will define a forward function for our network. And then we will conveniently use the automatic differentiation engine of Jax in order to differentiate through our network to obtain gradient estimates and then train the parameters using simple gradient descent such that ultimately our network output somehow looks like a sign function. Let's get started. Hi and welcome to this new video and the next installment of the series of training neural networks in different frameworks and with either using automatic differentiation or implementing the backward pass by hand. Here in this video we want to use the JAX deep learning framework in Python, which is a low level framework that offers all the building blocks for different kind of deep learning tasks, but can also be used for scientific simulations. The setting for learning this neural network is trying to making it as simple as possible. We will not use any train validation test split, no regularization, we will just use plain gradient descent without further modifications. And the basis upon which our network is learning is a data set which consists of n samples from a one-dimensional to one-dimensional mapping and we will follow the convention in Python in order to represent this data in a tabular format, so in a matrix, and this one will be the inputs x which are of shape n by one-dimensional and the outputs y, the targets, which will also be n by one dimensional. And then we will use the multi-layer perceptron architecture, which can just be defined by the number of layers. And then we will have the weight matrices and biases with corresponding shape. And we will use the sigmoid nonlinear activation function. And then the MLP architecture defines a forward pass by taking the input x, left multiplying it with the first weight matrix, obtaining the first state here just called y1 then we will add the bias and this plus operation is already interpreted to be a batched addition such that this bias vector is added to each of the rows in our matrix and then finally for the first layer we will apply the nonlinear activation function so here the sigmoid to obtain the activated state. With this, we enter the next layer, the process is repeated and it's repeated again. And in the very last layer, we will not use a nonlinear activation function, but just the identity to let our network have arbitrary output magnitudes. Then with the output here noted as y4 hat, we can compute a loss, which is basically a measure of how well our network performs. And here we will use a mean squared error loss so we take the output, subtract the reference, element-wise square it, and then compute the mean overall axis. Overall axis means in that case over both the batch dimension, which has n entries, as well as the spatial dimension, which has one entry. And then as a convention, we will add a factor of one half here. This forward pass is sufficient if you're already given weights and biases trained for your network. But if you want to do a learning task, which means is finding these weights and biases that minimize your loss, you need a starting point and you cannot just start at zero. So you cannot have the weights and biases being zero at the beginning of the optimization. And so we choose a random starting point. And this is a commonly used method due to Xavier Clot. And basically what it does, it selects the entries of the weight matrix independently from a uniform distribution whose limits depend on the transformation this matrix makes. So the stronger the transformation, so in other words, the higher the input dimension and the higher the output dimension of our matrix, the smaller this limit is chosen. And the reason for that can be, can be quite easily interpreted that we want our network to have a somehow low magnitude estimate in the beginning. And this allows us to have more stable training. And we will initialize the bias to zero. And then what is meant by learning? So learning is nothing else than the approximate solution to a parameter fit problem. This turns out to be a non-convex problem, so it's a rather hard problem, but oftentimes we are just interested in an approximate solution to this, such that we find somehow parameter estimates that yield a desirable network state. So how does that work? So we will start with initializing weights and biases, and then we will run the forward pass 
but now we make usage of the automatic differentiation engine in JAX, which only requires us to define the forward or primal evaluation, and then the function transformations in JAX take care of rewriting a function that also produces a gradient estimate. So this means the derivative of the loss with respect to bias 4, with respect to weight 4, bias 3, weight 3, and so on and so forth. And this is then really convenient because we can use this gradient to update the weight by saying, well, we take the weight and subtract the gradient here denoted with a bar on top. And then we will just repeat step two and three over and over until our loss is sufficiently decreased. Then let's start with our implementation and remove this hello world here and import the necessary packages. So we will need jax import jax.numpy as JNP, and then we will also need matplotlib.pyplot as plt. Then we can define some constants. So I want to use 200 samples. Then we can define the architecture of this MLP, which will have a one dimensional input layer. Then we have 10, 10, 10, so three hidden layers of dimension 10 and then a one dimensional output layer again. We will have a learning rate for the optimization of 0.1 and we will optimize for 30,000 epochs. Then first of all, I want to create our data set, which we want to do randomly. But for this, we need to account for the fact that random numbers in JAX work a little bit different. So they require, which has to be propagated for each of the random calls in order to ensure reproducibility. So we will create a key, which is a random number key. And let's define a seed. So let's take, for instance, 42. Then we can split this key into another key. So to override that, then we need an X key in order to produce the X samples, and then a Y noise key in order to produce the noise to corrupt our data a little bit to make the training harder. So we will do jacks.random.split on the key, and let's produce us three independent keys. Then we can get the X samples to our data set by doing jacks.random.uniform, so sampling from a uniform distribution using the X key. And the shape of this will be n samples by one. So essentially what we're now drawing is this X, which is of n by one dimensions. Let's go down again. And then let's define the limits. So the minimum value shall be zero and the maximum value shall be at two times i. Then we have our y samples, which will be given by calling the sign function element-wise on the x samples, and then corrupting it with noise by using dex.random.normal to draw from a normal distribution with our y noise key, and we will draw n samples by one noise entries, such that we corrupt each of the samples individually and then we will just multiply the noise with 0.3 basically this is the standard deviation of the normal we want to use shift enter executes the cell then let's look at the data real quick with a scatter plot on x samples and y samples here we go this is what you also saw in the intro it definitely looks like a sign function but we have some noise to it so the points are scattered away from it a little bit so now we can go to the next state, which is the weight initialization. And for this, I want to collect the weight matrices into lists, as well as the bias vectors and the activation functions. Functions. And basically, if we have layers given by 1, 10, 10, 1, we will have four entries in the weight matrices, bias vectors, and activation functions because we have four layer transitions. So we have the layer transition from the input to the hidden, from the hidden to the hidden, to the hidden to the hidden, and then hidden to the output. Okay, how do we get that? So for this, we will use some clever iteration by saying for fan in and fan out in some clever zip iterator. And fan in basically refers to the input dimension of our matrix and fan out is the output dimension. So in case for the first layer transition, fan in is one, the input dimension, and fan out is 10, the first hidden dimension. And in order to do that, we will use a zip iterator over the layers. First, we will index them excluding the last element 
and then we will index them excluding the first element. And as such, we will reduce the layers from five to four entries with this one only having the first four and this one having the last four. And then by sipping them together, we can get this nice fan in fan out iterator. Okay, then we can compute the kernel matrix uniform limit. So basically this is the limit due to Xavier Clobo. So we will take the square root of six divided by fan in plus fan out. And then we will draw again some uniform numbers. But again, as before, we have to split our key for this. So let's have key and W key. Forget for this, we will again override this global key, getting a new one, this W key, by doing jacks.random.split on the key, which does not take any additional arguments because by default, it will split into two keys. Then let's draw W by doing jacks.random.uniform on the W key. The dimension shall be pan in by pan out and the minimum value is minus the kernel matrix uniform limit and the maximum value is plus the kernel matrix uniform limit. Then we can also initialize our biases. This will be jnp.zeros of the fan out dimension because our bias vector is of course applied in this fan out dimension. Then we can append the weight matrices to our list and we can also append the bias vector to our list. And here for convenience, I also want to append to the activation functions list the sigmoid and we don't implement this ourselves. So for this, we will take the jacks.neural network library, which already has the sigmoid implemented for us. But since we do not want the sigmoid also at the very last layer, at the output layer, so let's override that and say activation functions indexed at the end is the identity and we can implement the identity with a lambda function, which just pushes through the input to the output. So shift enter then gives us the initial state of our network. Then we can define the forward function. So let's define network forward and this one shall take X weights, biases, and activations. And I'm deliberately using different names here because then we have our local scope. And I mean, we're sure that we're always referring to the arguments of the function. For this, let us use an helper variable which will be propagated through the network. So this shall refer to the activated state in each layer. And then we propagate through our network by going layer wise. So by feed forwarding this information. And again, let's use a sipped iterator by saying for W, B and F in zip of weights, biases and activation. We then do A being overwritten as the nonlinear activation function applied to A matrix multiplied with W plus B. And then the function returns A. So this is then the output of the network. Okay, let's take a look at how our network predicts the dataset samples. So let's do plt.scatter on x samples and y samples. So this is again the reference that we have. And then plt.scatter on x samples and network forward on x samples, weight matrices, bias vectors, and activation functions. Here we go. This is our initial prediction, the orange points. And that is a good initial prediction because it is in the same order of magnitude as our data points are in. And there is no crazy oscillation. So we see there's a little bit of a bending in the curve this network predicts, but it's nothing crazy. So that's a good starting point for the optimization. Let's go forward and define the forward loss function. So loss forward, which will take a y Yes, as well as a reference. And then basically it first computes the difference by saying y guess minus y reference. And then it returns the loss by being 0 0.5 times jnp dot mean of delta squared. So this gives us the mean squared error. Let's execute that. This is the loss forward. Let's also see what is our initial loss. So how good is the network given the initial parameters? So let's have loss forward 
on network forward with examples, weight matrices, bias vectors, and activation functions, as well as the Y samples. And here we have an initial loss of 0.31. It's hard to interpret this loss, but at least we hope that it goes down sufficiently as this is an indicator of how well we fit our network. Okay, now we can use the magic of automatic differentiation in order to transform our function into a format which not only produces the loss, but also gives us the gradients with respect to all the weight matrices and with respect to all the bias vectors. For this, we will create a new function I want to call the loss and cred fun, which is given according to dot value and cred. So value and cred is one of these function transformation Jax offers. I think the most intuitive function is cred, which just produces the gradient. But for automatic differentiation, we know that next to the gradient evaluation, we also have a primal evaluation. So the forward pass always needs to be executed. So we would get basically the loss estimate for free. So it is reasonable to put that together into one function. So technically what we would now do is take the derivative of a function concatenation of both the network forward as well as our loss forward. But in order to be even more concise, I want to create a lambda function which concatenates these two functions together and also captures from the environment. Okay, that sounds crazy. Let's just implement this. Let's have a lambda function which takes as input the weights and biases. And then basically what it does, it takes the loss forward function applied to the network forward function called on X samples, WS, BS, and activation functions. And then the loss forward also takes as a second argument, the Y samples. Okay, so what is going on here? So we created an anonymous function here the lambda function, which shall be the actual mapping we want to have within our optimization. Because if we are within our optimization or training loop, the samples, the activation functions and the references do not change. So we can kind of attach them to the function. This lambda function is a closure. It captures the environment and thereby creates a function which only takes weights and biases as input, but it knows the samples, it knows the activation functions, and it knows the targets. So it will always replace them at the correct position within the call to these two functions. So if we now execute this, we can query it and get a feeling for it. So let's have the initial loss. We have the initial weight gradient, we have the initial bias gradient, and we will get that by calling the loss and cred function on the weight matrices and bias vectors. I forgot. So this value and cred function, if you look at the definition of it, it says that it takes a function it wants to transform and also needs this arg nums. This means with respect to which input it should produce the gradient. And by default, it is zero. So it just produces the derivative or the gradient with respect to the weights. But we want to have it with respect to weights and biases. So what we will do is we say arg nums is a tuple of zero and one. And now this should work exactly. So now it returns the loss and a tuple of the gradients, which we can easily unpack with this syntax here. So let's look at the return values. Initial loss is the same value as from the primal execution. This is what we expect because doing a transformation with automatic differentiation typically does not change the numeric value of just doing the primal evaluation alone. But now we also have the initial weight gradient. And this is a bit cryptic, but what we see, it is a list of arrays. And arrays, in that case, are just generalization of matrices. So basically what it produces is a container of the same type as the primal input. So the primal input is the weight matrices which was a list of matrices. And then it produces a gradient, which is also a list of matrices. And in each of the entries in this matrices in this list, it has the information of how this entry affects the loss. 
So for instance, this might be here the entry of the very first matrix. And basically it means the derivative of the loss with respect to that entry. And now if we do our learning, we will use that in order to modify the original weight matrix because it provides us with a direction or the negative gradient provides us with a direction into which we should go in order to minimize the loss. Okay, long story short, let's implement our training loop. And for this, I want to record the loss history. So basically the loss value that we have in each epoch and then we can do four epoch in range of n epochs first we obtain the loss and then we obtain the weight gradients and the bias gradients by calling our nice function so this is the loss and cred function on the current weight matrices and the current bias vectors. And then we will use the weight gradients in order to update the weight matrices. And technically what we would do is we would iterate over the two containers and then update this. But JAX does not allow for array mutation. So it is not possible to override an array in place. So it's not allowed to override the matrix in place. So we will use one of JAX's utilities, which is based on the idea of pie trees. This is a bit abstract, but let's just implement it and then we will see. So we will override the weight matrices by calling jax.treemap. Treemap basically means it takes a pie tree and then applies a lambda function to it. I will explain that in a second. So let's implement the lambda function first, which should be clear. So this lambda function takes the weight matrix as well as its corresponding gradient, which is a matrix of the same shape. And then basically it returns weight matrix minus learning rate multiplied with the gradient. And then this tree map shall be applied to weight matrices and weight Gradients. Okay, so what is a pie tree? So a pie tree is the idea of collections of arrays that Jax understands. And our weight matrices is nothing else than a list of arrays. And our weight gradients is a list of arrays as well. And they are also identical. So they have, the list has the same length and the arrays within the list have the same dimensions. And this tree map basically takes these two pie trees and goes over all the arrays in the list and applies the function within there and thereby produces a new pie tree which is then the weight matrices and we overwrite that. Instead of doing an in-place mutation of the weight matrix we will just create a new pie tree and override it. The same can be done for the bias vectors by doing jax.treemap on lambda which takes b and b gradient and then does b minus learning rate times b gradient and takes the bias vectors as well as the bias gradients. Okay, then let's do some logging. So let's say if the epoch is divisible by 100, so every 100 epochs, I want to print out the loss with a formatted string, like saying epoch is epoch and loss is loss. And then we will also append to our loss history list our current loss. And this is our training loop. Let's execute it and see. Okay, it runs. So epoch zero, epoch 100. Wow, this would take forever. Let's imagine we said we want to do 30,000 epochs. Let's interrupt the execution. So it should, yes, that's now interrupted. And one of the magic in JAX, which is just in time compilation, so we will override the loss and cred function with the JAX.JIT transformation applied to it. And now JAX internally traces and analyzes the function so it analyzes the function which produces the loss and the gradient estimate, which is the major computational burden within our training loop and tries to just in time compile it, optimize it even. So now our training loop should be considerably faster. Let's see. And let's run it. Okay, here we go. That's way faster. I mean, now we started not at the initial guess anymore, but a little bit after I think 300 or 400 epochs, but never mind. We decreased our loss quite significantly. Let's take a look at the loss history by plotting the loss history 
and setting the y scale to logarithmic and here we go this is our loss plot going down that's very nice but let's see if this loss estimate that we have here corresponds to parameters which yield a desirable network state for this we will do plt.scatter on the data samples again and then we will also scatter the network prediction so x samples and then network forward on the x samples the weight matrices the bias vectors and the activation functions here we go isn't that beautiful that's also the plot you saw in the intro of course one can argue it's not a perfect sign function and we are also evaluating the network on the training data but if you give it different data that's within this 0 and 2 pi, you would also see that it follows the sine curve. And even with this not yet perfect result, I think it's still quite impressive of what you can do in these few lines of Jack's Python code and also this reasonable training time of, let's say, 10 seconds on a CPU because there is no GPU used here. Let's summarize real quick what we did. So the first step was to get our data. So here we used artificial data, which we just randomly sampled. Then importantly, we defined the initial state of the network by using the Xavier Chloro initialization. Then we could build a forward function, which steps through our feed forward network. We saw that the initial prediction of the network is bad in a sense of how it fits the data, but it's good as an initial guess for the optimization. Then we also defined our loss function. And then the truly amazing part was that we could use the reverse mode automotive engine of JAX in order to transform our primal execution. So the primal execution goes from the parameters to the loss into a function that not only produces the loss estimate, but also gives us the gradient. Then we used just-in-time compilation in order to make that function run reasonably fast and in a training loop of 30,000 iterations with all of the samples at the same time, we then reduced our loss quite significantly and also got a really nice gradient estimate. This channel is supported by Pasteur Labs and the Institute for Simulation Intelligence. Click the link in the video description to find out more how they merge machine learning and simulation in order to reimagine the scientific method. Also, a big thanks to all my Patreons. If you also want to support my vision of free education on advanced mathematical topics, you find the link to the Patreon page down in the video description. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, then please leave a like and consider subscribing to the channel. There is more awesome content like this on automatic differentiation, on neural networks. Maybe you're interested in physics informed neural networks, then also stay tuned for that. Here you will now see similar videos and I hope to see you in one of the next videos. Thank you.